Insurance is there to protect you against the threat of financial loss caused by everyday events. It removes uncertainty by transferring the unknown consequences of losses from theft, fire, floods or accidents to an insurance company. The protection gained from paying an insurance company a regular sum of money is called a premium. By collecting premiums from many people, the insurer accumulates a pool from which losses can be paid for. We represent short-term insurance companies in Zimbabwe and are here to help you understand how they can help you with everyday insurance because you never know. For more information, call us on 0242-708-031 up to 2 or visit our offices at number 4 Josiah Tongogara Avenue, Harare. Well, good morning to all our farmers and welcome to this, our first webinar, our first meeting actually since last year in 2021, but this is a, a fresh start for 2022 and we are continuing our conversation uh, with respect to your activity, which is farming, and this is the fifth in our series, which is ongoing, by the way, and we tackle once again that whole challenge that we all have as human beings, what do you and I do with time and change? Because these are the only guarantees we have. Time will move and things will change. And already as we have borne witness, uh, the rain season has been less than predictable. And if you were not prepared, uh, unfortunately, you may have found yourself in a situation which is undesirable. But the good news is, this very platform brought to you by the Insurance Council of Zimbabwe is really about helping you to manage the uncertainty. Whatever we, you and I cannot control in this life must be managed. And to help us understand how we manage uncertainty, how we manage that which we cannot control, we have two speakers today who are going to guide, uh, to guide us through this process. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Rawlings Coffee, uh, who is one of our speakers. So can I say good morning to you, Rawlings? Yes, good morning, from, uh, good morning, Patrick, and good morning, uh, our farmers. Wonderful. And uh, also, we're in the company of our friend and uh, compatriot through this process, who represents one of the country's leading risk advisors, John Chirindo. John, good morning. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Patrick. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Good morning, Thomas. Good morning. Everybody. Wonderful. Good to hear from you, John, and Happy New Year to both of you. So to Thank our you. listeners, um, we are going to start with Rawlings, who is going to take us through an understanding, a deeper understanding of what farming is as a business. But secondly, he will also share with us the keys to farming success. What are these keys that you and I, if we knew better, can make our operation better. So Rawlings, I'd like to hand over to you, if I may, and again, welcome you and thank you for your time. Uh, thanks, uh, Patrick, and um, good morning once again, our farmers. So uh, first of all, you know, farming as a business is, is very broad, and um, I have a few minutes in my presentation, so I'll try and compress uh, farming as a business, the whole uh, issues involved in farming as a business in the next few minutes. But I would, I would, I would also like to con con congratulate all our farmers for the interest in starting your own uh, farm uh, that you run as uh, a, a business. So the decision uh, to become a farmer is not a light one, and it involves a number of uh, variables, and it also requires uh, a lot of uh, uh, effort. But uh, we believe the starting point is really to understand what farming as a business is. So we'll go straight into a basic definition of uh, farming as a business. So the, the definition or the basic uh, definition is that a farm business is a commercial activity that operates with uh, an intention of making profit or of uh, making money. So as a commercial activity, what we mean is that you have products or services that you are providing for the market. 
So it has to be an entity or an organization that is providing a commodity or uh, a service. This uh, can be your final uh, product. It can be your tomatoes. It can be your uh, fat and keto. It can be your uh, broiler chickens. It can be milk and, uh, and so on. So the intention of running a commercial entity as highlighted there is the, uh, it's, it has to do with making money. So this means for you to have uh, or to see your farming as a business, you need to have a commercial mindset or a business thinking. That's where it, uh, it begins. I've seen a lot of farmers doing subsistence uh, farming on, uh, on commercial land resulting in low productivity. So the main problem there is the business mindset. So you find with a, with a subsistence mindset on commercial land, it means each and every season, you will need a kickstart. You will need free inputs for you to uh, uh, grow your crops in that year. So if the intention is to, to, to make profit, your actions prior to running your business will then tell whether or not you run a successful uh, farm business. So perhaps maybe you are now asking uh, what farming uh, as a business is how you can start and perhaps also how you can operate uh, your farm as, as a business. So we'd want to divide the farm business activities into three. So there you have your pre-production. Your pre These are activities done before you go into actual production. Then uh, next you have your production. These are activities directly related to your uh, production or activities done during your production, be it you are producing tomatoes. Uh, this is now you know, the technical part of, uh, of, of uh, uh, pro, uh, producing your tomatoes. Then we then have the third key part, which is post-production. So the first step back to the pre-production. The first step really is to come up with a, a feasibility study. So this is meant to road test or to test run your idea. It's a simple yet a powerful tool. So it can be defined as a controlled process of uh, identifying existing problems. It can also identify opportunities and determine objectives, thus describing the situations and defining the successful uh, outcomes. And it also assesses the range of costs and benefits associated with uh, uh, running your, your business or in solving the problems that you would have uh, identified. So it is used to support the decision-making process based on a cost-benefit analysis of the actual business or your uh, project uh, viability. Remember, this is done way before you go into actual production. And this is at pre-production uh, stage. So be in mind that uh, most farm business uh, opportunities have at least one single fatal flaw that will then lead to failure. So you need to give your opportunity or whatever business that you are thinking of, give it a road test. This is way before you go into uh, pr uh, production. So a, feasibil a, a feasibility study is really a part of a critical process that is farm planning. So it allows us farmers to really evaluate the risks. You know, that's a key area, risk management, prior uh, to, to, to uh, your production. But since this is a, a, a very major topic, uh, John will, will cover it uh, in, in, in detail. So your uh, feasibility study will then answer questions on your market uh, viability. So first of all, we need to accept as farmers that the farmer's market or the common farmer's market is an economic, uh, an economic machine. That's what I call it. It doesn't matter or it doesn't care whether your farm business will succeed or it fails. It doesn't matter or it doesn't care whether you make a profit or loss. So that's the starting point. You need to study the market, study it very closely and to see how best you can uh, then take advantage of uh, the, the dynamics. So what I'm simply saying is the market comes first. We have risk management as number one. 
Then next is the market. So if you, if you have to compare uh, uh, production versus uh, market, it's, it's, it's actually the market that comes first. So you need to tackle farm business issues in the right order. Many of us farmers really make uh, a mistake of putting a cart before the horse. The market is where demand, that is where the purchasing power, that is where your uh, sales revenue, and that is where the competition is made, not at your farm, not at uh, uh, the production level. So start with the market. Ask yourself, is there a market? What opportunities are there in the market? Are there issues with uh, quality? Are there issues with uh, packaging issues that you can solve? Then also another key question that you can ask yourself is about adding value. Is there any opportunity for you to add value to your uh, produce? And if you start the market trends, you will also notice that uh, there are certain uh, parts of uh, uh, you know, the time or, 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 or the market where you can get the highest or where you can fetch the highest uh, price. And look back also into production. Where are you likely to get the lowest production cost? If you match those two, then you can make uh, uh, a better uh, decision. Another thing that the feasibility study will show is a business model viability. How viable is your model? It will also look at uh, the technical viability, such as I will then answer questions such as what crops uh, or livestock are suitable uh, for, your, for your region. And also, what is the knowledge that you need or that is required? What are the skills that are required to run such a, a farm business operation? You also know from the feasibility study, the technical parameters uh, for, your, for your business, the yield bit, the weight bit, the quality, uh, and, and, uh, and so forth. Then uh, it can also still under technical viability, it can also help you to reach maximum yield or maximum uh, potential, be it in weight, be it uh, in yield. So the feasibility study is a very, very important tool that will also show on the management side, the management model that you need. What model is required to run your uh, venture or your desired venture or uh, business efficiently? What are the skills that are required for the management? So we need to acquire more professional skills, not only in basic production. This is where we normally make a mistake. We put most of our resources in acquiring skills and knowledge in the basic production side or on the basic production side, leaving out the business side. Then another important thing that uh, the feasibility study will show is to do with uh, economic uh, and uh, financial uh, viability. How much is required and when is it required? So these questions can be answered uh, with uh, the, the feasibility study. Where are you going to get the money? It can also help with a simple break-even analysis. The minimum units or the minimum uh, sales that you need in order to cover up your, your uh, overheads. Then uh, it also comes with uh, cash flow projections. That is how much cash do you need to efficiently uh, run your business before you run out of, uh, of, of cash. Then uh, there's also a budget tool that we developed. I'll do a simple um, uh, illustration of the budget tool. So this is a, a PDF. You don't need internet. You only need your phone. You only need your gadget. So the tool is very interactive. What you do is you put the name or you write the name of your crop there. You indicate the variety, the source, the planting date, the germination date you know, the area uh, under uh, 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 the area that you are planning to, to, to plant, the planting season, uh, the plant date of harvesting. Then after that now, there is the interactive part. It 
what, what it does, it, uh, for instance, it's, uh, we go under expenditure, you want to calculate your input cost, and this is a, a sugar bean, you need 100 kgs of seed, and your, your, your unit cost is $2.20, making a total of $220 US, and that's for your seed. So if you need uh, basal dressing, so there you have 12 kgs. So say your uh, soil uh, testing results or analysis results uh, have indicated that you need maybe 15 bags. So you just change there from uh, 12 to 15. And then it automatically changes everything there. Without internet access, without any uh, you know, fancy uh, gadget, just your phone, you can simply calculate uh, all the uh, expenses that you need. So from there, you add on the, the you go to the uh, production cost, you add uh, the, the harvesting costs, the cost of uh, marketing your, your, your projects, then right at the bottom, it will then automatically calculate for you your gross uh, profit or loss. That is you know, well, from your total sales, it then subtracts uh, your, your input costs and uh, expenses. Then you get uh, your total uh, gross profit. So this is a very uh, important tool and we'll definitely share with you. If you want to receive it, just uh, send us your, your email address via the, the, the chat section. And if you are watching on, on, on Facebook, just comment there, we'll definitely send through uh, this uh, budget. Then back to, to the uh, presentation. So these are now uh, parts of the feasibility study. This is a sales focus. And remember we said this is being done or you are doing this process way before you go into actual uh, production. So the sales focus really shows uh, the, the, the sales that you're expecting for instance, this is tomato production. So in month one, month two, month three, there's nothing there. Then in month four, the sales uh, starts trickling in. Then you also have your, your expenses uh, there, your unit uh, cost, your direct unit cost. Then uh, this is very important and it's part of uh, a feasibility study. Uh, you can do it yourself or you can hire someone to, to, to guide or help you. But it is important that you, uh, you know, uh, really own the feasibility study. Then this is a profit and loss. It's also part of the feasibility study done way before you go into production. It indicates your uh, projected uh, profit uh, or loss. So you know ahead of time how your business is going to be. So remember, this is a road test. You are testing your business to see how it will perform. And this is the cash flow. And remember, you know, a, a business can be very profitable, but can close due to uh, cash flow uh, challenges. Then this is a balance sheet just to show your uh, assets versus uh, liabilities. So the feasibility study also looks at the market, analyzes your market, you know, uh, your potential customers. Uh, this will help you in terms of uh, planning. It also looks at the management, the personnel that you need uh, to efficiently run your uh, desired uh, project. So it also shows the startup expenses, the startup costs. Uh, you know, how much do you need to start? Do you need to invest in drip irrigation? How much are you going to, uh, you know, invest in risk management? How much are you going to need for for seed uh, land preparation and so forth? It. It, it, it also indicates or shows you uh, that uh, critical information to make uh, a decision on whether or not you should go ahead and run that project. So this is um, uh, part of, of, of the feasibility study as well. It's a break-even analysis, really showing you uh, the monthly units that you need to sell in order to, to break even. Then it also shows you the minimum price that you can sell your product for to the extent that even when you go to the market and you are not getting uh, that price, then something has to be done. Uh, something has to be done right. You need to go back uh, uh, on the drawing table and do it right. So uh, this is uh, this was now the pre-production 
part of the of your farm business then on the production side the major one is risk so again on pre-production the first one was risk and on production is risk so leave it to uh, mr chirindo you you will cover this in detail so i'll go into uh, the other areas under the production part so the first one is uh, the second one is technical you need to do it right always make friends with uh, agronomists uh, veterinarians, uh, extension officers, any agricultural professional that you know, make friends with them because they play a key role in the success of your business. Issues like tech, uh, technology transfer, like capacity building, like assisting you in decision making, uh, helping you with market knowledge. Uh, these are some of the benefits that you get from engaging agricultural uh, professionals. Then the next key issue is record keeping. You need to keep records. And these are both uh, production and business records. So keep your records. Both, I've seen most of our farmers really focus more on the production records. When they received their breeding stock, when they made their breeding stock, when they are feeding them, you know, uh, when they're expecting to uh, kindle, uh, when they're expecting to sell, yes, that's good. You're keeping your production records, but put the same effort on the business uh, side or on the business records. So uh, let's not make that mistake of concentrating on production records, ignoring the business records. Another key issue there is separating business from personal transactions. Don't mix these two. They are separate. Otherwise, you know, at the end of the day, you won't know whether or not you are making a profit or loss. Many times we end up as farmers with a subsistence mindset, confusing sales revenue with profit. Whenever we receive a lump sum, we think that's our profit. So those two are also uh, different. The sales revenue and your profit, those two are clearly uh, different and you can tell from the feasibility study that you would have done prior to going into uh, uh, production. So if you find yourself wanting a kickstart every season, looking for investment uh, on the same size of operation, uh, it means you are not running your farm uh, as a business. It is usually a result of mixing these two issues, the personal and business uh, transactions. Then uh, on the post uh, production uh, checklist, the first one there is also risk. There are a lot of risks there. And Mr. Chirindo will uh, cover uh, on that one. So uh, the other issues are value addition. You need to see beyond production. Find opportunities beyond production. You know, gonna are, uh, are the days when we saw ourselves as uh, uh, just farmers, uh, as if our, our job was just tilling the land, then produce uh, for, 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 for the middlemen. No, see beyond production. So this also includes uh, post-harvest management uh, practices. So you need to invest, to invest in that knowledge way before you go into uh, actual uh, production. Then another key area is sales and marketing. So you need to encourage your sales team, that is if you have one. If not, if you are the one doing both sales and marketing, uh, use social media channels. Ask your customers for referrals. These are some uh, of the tips that you can use attend local market events, sell to uh, your network, uh, try to go into partnerships, and even code calling, visit these supermarkets, you know, and see uh, what they need to get you listed as one of their suppliers. You know, marketing is very, very important. It helps you and your business to leap from not being known, from your products not being known, you know, and from not receiving any calls, to customers knowing you, to you know, uh, the customers calling you asking for your product. This is the responsibility of uh, your, your marketing. Then the other one there is review. And this has to do with financial reports. And most of these are similar to the ones that we saw in uh, the, the, the feasibility study. 
the difference is that these are now reports of what would have then happened uh, during the production period. So remember, we're in the business of farming and a lot of parameters can really show that we are doing well. You have a good crop, a good green crop. You have very big uh, maize cobs. You have uh, uh, well-fattened animals, but there's only one real yardstick farmers. And that's a profit and loss statement. At the end of the season, how much have you made? Of course, you had very good uh, cattle, very good looking cattle, very good breeds. You have the, uh, maybe you had the, uh, you know, the biggest broilers in your, in your area. But at the end of the day, farmers, how much have you made? This is very, very uh, important. And it's part of the review. So from there, now, uh, I, I will cover on the keys to success. What do you need to run uh, uh, a, a farm as a business or to successfully run your farm business? First of all, you need to have a clear vision. You need to set your clear goals as well. Because remember, if you don't have a target, you will neither aim nor miss. That's number one. Then number two, you need technical and business knowledge and management skills. So get training on both. It's also important that you visit both successful and unsuccessful farms. Know why they failed. Normally I've seen, you know, farmers, we, we visit successful farms, but there are some who tried and failed. Visit them, see why they failed and, you know, learn from them. Then you can also take advantage of our agribusiness media platforms to learn for free. And this is very important. Then another one is uh, uh, risk management. Yes, Mr. Chirindo will cover that. Then uh, you also need to know uh, or to gather you know, enough financial resources. And there are a number of available options for financing and always do a proper research and engage uh, professionals. Another key to success is starting with the market and not production. We talked about this before, but uh, you know, some farmers confuse this with uh, making an order or getting an order for your products. No, 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 no. We are not saying by starting with the market, it means you have an order for, 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 for 100 tons of tomatoes, an order uh, you know, for 1,000 chickens. No, 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 no. What we are saying is know the trends. Study the trends. And by studying the trends, you know what happened last year, what happened in 2020. You know, that will help you to make better decisions on when to, to grow. And that way you won't go wrong. And after production, that's where proper marketing happens. So pre-production, we are talking about market research. Then post-production, this is now uh, proper marketing. So market is, is, is that part of your farm business that transforms your production uh, activities into cash. Whatever that you have produced can only be transformed into cash via marketing and sales. And it's more than just selling your products. It's managing all activities that are related to uh, selling, including looking at the bigger picture and making sure that you are on track. It is also important that you research on the problem that you are solving. Don't just be you know, a me too uh, farmer or, or go, go into this me too business. No, first research on a problem that you want to solve. Is it a, sh a shortage of, uh, of a product? Is it uh, about the poor presentation of the current products? Then that's where you, know, you can focus on improving uh, or, or bringing uh, solutions to the current challenges uh, in the industry. It is also important that you see beyond production. Try to understand the consumer's pain points. Maybe you are into uh, bean production. Why not package your beans? Why not package into 500 grams? It's simple, just grading the beans brand, uh, and, and pack in, 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 in uh, branded plastics. Or if you want, you can then uh, go ahead, boil, uh, either boil or even free, you can, you can boil, freeze, and then sell, uh, you know, frozen beans. So you need to look for ways to move closer to the customer. That's where your, your income is. That's where the money uh, is. You know, some research that I did uh, sometime back showed that for every dollar that is paid by the consumer, 
if 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 any consumer today goes into a supermarket, pays a dollar for any ag-related product, you know, a farmer is getting 10 to 11 cents. So you need to move closer to the consumer. That's where the money is. The remaining 90, uh, 89 cents or 90 cents is then going to those that are into value addition, those that are into you know, uh, packaging, uh, proper packaging, proper branding. That's where you need to go. So the further along uh, the marketing chain that you go or I go, the higher the selling price we get. So we need to see beyond the farm gate. Remember the industry is not what it used to be. The conditions of uh, uh, survival in, 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 in farming really now uh, involve or include marketing and sound business management. Back then, you know, our, our duty as farmers was just to till the land, produce crops, then the middlemen will come and buy. But we need to see beyond the farm gate. Another thing that you need to do to ensure you are running a successful farm business is to think big. Say no to average thinking. I've had so many farmers, uh, or oh, many times uh, of, of us, uh, you know, people uh, talking about setting realistic uh, goals. We need not to confuse uh, realistic goals with average. If the average yield, for instance, in sugar bean is 1.2 tons, that mustn't be your target. Why not push it higher to reach the maximum yield potential? So you need to set a pace as a farmer so that other farmers, you then become a lead farmer and other farmers will come and learn from you. Another important key is getting the right people. Pay them well, treat them well, and uh, ensure that you know, uh, they're doing the right thing. You also need to invest in technology, embrace technology, move with the times and use efficient uh, systems such as drip irrigation, invest in solar, those are some of the key areas that will uh, help your farm business. So the last one I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I want to talk about is scaling up. I've seen some farmers out there who have been growing a single acre ever since they started production. Some started with 50 chickens and they are still doing 50 chickens. And this is three years, two years down the line. Some started with 100 chickens per, uh, per, per, per cycle, and they are still doing 100 chickens per cycle. The reason is they are not scaling up their businesses. So you need to scale up even without external funding. Start small. Scale up with the available resources. Bid 10%, bid 15%. It doesn't matter. Grow your business. Just eight, maybe 25 chickens. To, 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 to the 100 that you started with. So these are some of the key uh, areas uh, that will help you in running uh, a successful uh, farm business. And uh, with that, I think I've come to my end of uh, uh, the presentation and I hope I've done justice. Uh, thank you. Absolutely, Rawlings. I think you have indeed. I think in a very short space of time, you have really touched uh, on what I would call an all-round view of what it is that constitutes farming. And uh, just to sum up what you have said, I think for me it goes back to what you said somewhere towards the end when you said it all starts with having a vision. Uh, somebody once said that um, the path to success starts with answering one fundamental question, where are you going? So to all our farmers, the question is, where are you going? Do you have a direction beyond just producing? Are you clear what you want to be doing? Where are you wanting to add value? So thank you, Rawlings. Thank you so much, because uh, I'm sure all the farmers appreciate the, in, the uh, input, uh, particularly the tools that you have also provided that they can use and apply directly. So farmers, you can see, the, it may be just an hour that we have together but you can leave with ideas that you can actually implement right now. In the very next hour, you can do things that can change the path that you are on. So now we transition to our next speaker. Rawlings made reference many times to the idea of risk. Risk is a fact.
Risk is all around us, but risk can also be managed. So John is with us. John uh, rep is, a re is a business representative of one of the biggest players in risk advisory services. And we welcome him. And we say to you, John, the time is open and uh, the floor is yours, sir. Hello, Patrick. Hi, John. Can you hear me? We are ready for you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, good morning, once again, viewers. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, uh, to touch on uh, agriculture insurance. And uh, I hope we, are, we can all see my screen. Can, I can confirm. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so uh, as we all know, agriculture insurance is such a vast topic. Uh, so many things will happen on a farm uh, in terms of the maybe the types of crops that a farmer can grow, the types of, uh, of livestock uh, that can be kept on the farm, uh, you know, and, and so on. So it, it's such a vast topic. Uh, unfortunately, because of limited time, we won't be able to cover all the various crops and livestock um, uh, underwriting issues or insurance issues that we, we, we would have wanted to talk about. So in a nutshell, uh, farm insurance is uh, basically a, a means of compensation in the event that something happens on a farm that may uh, affect your, your income. Uh, if you have insurance, then the insurer will compensate you for that loss. And uh, to be able to, 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 to be compensated, you need to be paying a premium, a small consideration, which is called a premium, which can be paid quarterly or monthly or annually. So like we say, the insur agriculture insurance is the insurance of crops. Uh, with this can be field crops, uh, horticultural crops, uh, greenhouse crops, or even plantations and so on. All the various crops that can be grown on the farm, the insurance is available for those crops. Then livestock, uh, what comes to mind for most people is uh, cattle. Uh, but of course, livestock is, is not just limited to cattle. Uh, it also includes things like your goats, things like your pigs, uh, things like poultry and other, uh, other small stock. Then uh, because on a farm, we also have buildings, uh, we have uh, equipment, your tractors, uh, your, your tillage equipment, spray equipment and so on. All these uh, come under agriculture insurance. Then any stocks that you may have, it can be stocks of inputs or stocks of the final commodities that you would have harvested. That can also be covered by insurance. Uh, any other physical infrastructure like the dams uh, could also be covered. Uh, then we also have uh, you know, uh, accidents that can happen on the farm. So the workers, the farmer and, and these workers or the workers should also would also need to be you know that security in the event that uh, you know they are injured whilst uh, carrying out an operation on farm then there should be the medical cover or life cover uh, to be able to come in and compensate for that for the whatever uh, injury would have happened then on a farm we may also have visitors uh, who may be also be uh, you know injured uh, through the operations that we, we are carrying out on the farm uh, you may be knocked over by a tractor and, and so on. So liability insurance is also, is also key. So we need uh, uh, to, to, to have uh, this uh, third party or a liability insurance uh, to be able to come in when that happens. Why is agriculture insurance important? I think we all know that agriculture is the backbone of the Zimbabwean economy, contributing almost 20% to our GDP, 75% uh, of uh, merchandise, uh, merchandise exports, and is also a, a source of livelihood for the large uh, majority of uh, our population. Uh, we, our farmers are mainly smallholder farmers, especially following the advent of the land reform program. We have our, you know, the traditional communal farmers, we have A1 farmers, also now have A2 farmers in addition to the commercial farmers. So all these uh, categories of farmers can be insured. There are products targeting all these farmers. And uh, I think it's also important to mention that, uh, you know, with insurance, there's income stability. 
uh, which uh, will enable you to even take, uh, you know, uh, uh, loans uh, to, 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 to buy equipment on the farm uh, and so on, because you know that if anything happens to the crop, the, the insurer will compensate and then you can meet your installment obligations or repayment obligations for, for whatever inputs you have purchased. Again, continuing on, um, on that, why is it important uh, to insure your crops? Because we know that uh, farming is expensive. If you look at crops like uh, tobacco, uh, blueberries, chilies, peppers, and so on, uh, you, you can have a cost amounting to maybe up to $8,000 or $10,000 US dollars per hectare. And once you have spent that much money, you don't want something to happen to the crop uh, the, this total loss, and then you lose all your investment. You need to have insurance to come in so that you are able to uh, meet your financial uh, obligations. Okay, uh, there's also the issue of uh, weather variability and unpredictability. If you look at the 21 to 22 uh, season, where we started off, uh, you know, the, the, for, for beginners, our season was late. Uh, we started receiving rains in November, and then we had plenty of rain throughout December, throughout January, there was so much rain. Then all of a sudden in February, for, the, for most regions in the country, uh, rains stopped. And the whole month of February, a lot of farmers did not experience any rains. Right. So that kind of uh, variability and predictability means that, you know, your crop could be affected and you need insurance to be able to kick in uh, and compensate in the event that uh, there is a, an intra-seasonal drought like we experienced in February or there's excessive rainfall like we experienced in December and January. Then we also have issues of uh, uh, natural disasters. We, we experienced at the, towards the end of January, uh, tropical storm Anna which uh, devastated uh, quite, uh, you know, many um, areas in, uh, in Mount Darwin. So because of that, you know, and uh, we don't know where next it will hit. We had Cyclone Idai in, in, in Manika Land some years back and so on. So these natural disasters means that the, there is a high possibility that uh, you, you will suffer loss in the event that they, they hit your area. There's also the, the issue of increased investment in farming, I think, which uh, also, uh, ties in with the first point. Uh, you know, we buy a lot of equipment on the farm and this equipment does not come cheap. Uh, our combine harvesters, uh, you know, our motorized sprayers and so on can amount to even half a million dollars. So if you have a crop, which then, of course, we buy most of this on credit, maybe pay repayment over five years or even 10 years. So if you have crops, which is your sole source of livelihood and it's not protected, you lose an entire season of crop as a result of something like hail and so on, then what happens to your monthly installments or quarterly installments to pay back for this equipment if you don't have insurance? You need to have insurance so that uh, if you, your crop is lost, you can then uh, recover and be able to pay back uh, installments uh, from your the insurance payout. Specialization in farming, uh, we know it's almost like, uh, you know, putting all your eggs in one basket. If you're doing apples, and this is the main only operation on the farm. Uh, a disease that uh, affects apples, uh, you know, comes in and then you, you lose your crop and you, you have no alternative source of income. Then it, it becomes a problem. It, the same applies to even poultry farmers, even influenza can, can come in and destroy your entire flock. You need to have insurance to be able to then uh, come in and you are able to meet all your other financial obligations. We also talk of disease exposure in boundaryless countries, you know, with the free movement of people across borders can uh, is the cause transmission of disease, which can affect crops, which can affect animals. Uh, well, a case in point, we, we know COVID-19, which has spread across the entire world because of this movement of individuals across boundaries. The same will app can apply whether it's, uh, you know, uh, foot and mouth disease, can be transmitted from one country to another. Uh, you know, even influenza, which affects uh, poultry, can also be transmitted from one country to another because of this uh, traffic uh, of individuals across boundaries. 
Then we also have new virulent disease organisms. COVID-19 again is an example. Um, uh, you, you, uh, African swine fever, uh, you, you, uh, med cow disease, uh, things like that. All these diseases can cause a lot of damage if they affect your farm. Like I said, fortunately, we have insurance covers for all these uh, issues, your fuel crops, which I've uh, mentioned, uh, your, your beef, your livestock, which include your beef, your dairy, goats, pigs, uh, poultry, and so on. Plus talk, uh, which can be horses or breeding, pedigree animals, your plantations, your tea, bananas, coffee, what have you, aquaculture, we're talking of your, your, the, the fish farm, the farmers, right? Uh, this is uh, also a, an area of, uh, you know, of growth uh, in Zim, where we are receiving so many inquiries. Then your horticulture, I think uh, there's so many examples there, your greenhouse crops, uh, and so on. Right, uh, so all, all, you know, all these, uh, you know, enterprises need to, to, to be protected against the risk. And uh, by definition, I would say risk is the possibility of an unfortunate occurrence that results in financial loss to the farmer. Uh, and uh, nowadays, you know, people are more aware of risk uh, because it's increasing in agriculture with these drought spells that are, are happening, these excessive rainfalls and so on. Uh, but uh, whilst uh, some of these perils may be unavoidable, but uh, they can be managed. If it's drought, maybe you develop irrigation, uh, you, you, you plant within the correct you know, planting window so that uh, your crop at critical stages uh, is receiving uh, you know, water. If you plant too early, maybe the, your maize crop and when it's tussling, that's when the dry spell, which has become very common around uh, January, February now in recent years, uh, you know, it's tussling and then it, 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 and you don't have any irrigation, then you can have a total loss of crop. So planting, you know, at the right time or at the optimum time in terms of the, the planting window is key uh, to, to manage uh, things like, you know, interests not out and so on. And also, I think we need to be aware that while some of this risk will cause loss, some of uh, these risks, if managed properly, can also uh, lead to uh, higher returns, uh, like you know, where you growing uh, uh, your horticulture crops uh, uh, like out of season. As long as you are confident that you can manage things like frost uh, and you have irrigation, uh, then if you grow certain crops like maybe potatoes or tomatoes, out, even your onions out of season, you know you will have a higher return because on the markets there will be a less uh, produce. Uh, and uh, you, you, your crop will fetch premium prices. So you need to be also aware of these, uh, you know, um, uh, upside, uh, you know, uh, opportunities uh, that uh, can, you can benefit from. And managing these risks starts with uh, being able to identify uh, which uh, risk, uh, risks affect uh, your crop or livestock. Uh, they can be natural risks, uh, they can be social risks, uh, they can be economic risks, and uh, you, need, you can manage on the farm, like we have said, we'll give you examples of how you can do that. Uh, we, I spoke of uh, you know, irrigation management and so on. Uh, we'll discuss other uh, measures that you can implement in, a, in coming slides. And you can also have uh, legal risks as, as well as the personal risks, uh, you know, risk of accidents or death, uh, the whole liability that we, we, we spoke about. John, I beg your pardon. Quick one. Uh, we have 10 minutes to go. Okay. Thank you. I'll try to speed up. Okay. So uh, here yeah, I've just outlined some of the risk management measures that you can implement, including locating your field uh, in, a, you know, in, in an area that is ideal, where it's properly drained with deep soils, a timely planting within the uh, planting window that I talk, spoke of, uh, you have good land preparation, uh, cultural practices like crop rotation and so on, the optimum plant population, right? If you need to do any gap filling, whether it's in tobacco or it's in maize, you'll do that so that you have a population of at least around 65 uh, to 67,000 for uh, your maize uh, so that you get the, 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 you are able to attain the, the yield that you need. The inequality and adequacy of the required sources, which can be labor, your input, other inputs, uh, and uh, any buildings like uh, curing facilities, uh, you know, uh, cold rooms, uh, depending on whether you need those. Weed, pest, and disease control, 
uh, fire prevention and control, your fire guards, uh, you know, uh, are, are key here, especially for uh, crops that can easily catch fire, uh, like your wheat, your barley, uh, which uh, are dry at, uh, the, at a time when all the surrounding uh, grass or bush is also dry and wildfires can easily spread from, uh, you know, outside the field into the field. Harvesting and post-harvesting, processing management, uh, the curing of tobacco is an example. Then your farm records uh, should also uh, be there so that you, you, you can track what is happening on the farm and make any adjustments uh, in terms of even the planting period, the quantity of inputs that you are using uh, to make sure that you optimize on your yield. Uh, diversification, not having your eggs in one basket like we were talking about in adequacy of financial resources, so developing all farm sources of income and so on. Those are some of the measures that you can implement on the farm. But of course, uh, whilst you, you may be able to do all this, uh, you still have certain periods which you cannot do anything about. And if you look at this uh, pie chart, we talk of drought, there's not much that you can do. Um, you know, you, you cannot have 100% uh, percent irrigated crop in, a, in a, any country. So you will still have your dryland crop, which is vulnerable for the drought. Uh, you have excessive moisture day, you, uh, like we experienced in December, January. You have frost, not uh, unless your crop is under greenhouse, but again, not all crops can be grown, it should be grown under greenhouse because of the cost of benefit implications, uh, hail, diseases, and so on. All these will affect uh, your crops. So how, which means that you then need to, to have insurance for these crops that you cannot uh, easily manage on the farm. And um, uh, these perils which will be covered, fire, hail, frost, uh, atmospheric disturbance, uh, lightning, um, moisture stress, you know, which is drought, a rainstorm, uh, damage by birds or animals, malicious damage, perversions of nature, pests and diseases. All these will be covered under your insurance policy. Where damage occurs early in the season, you can be compensated to the extent of your inputs, which is a replanting subsidy to make you re to, to enable you to replant uh, your, your crop uh, where you know there's still time to do that. Then in terms of the premium rate, uh, your premium rate, uh, these are just averages or standards uh, which uh, are used to, to guide insurers in terms of uh, maybe the levels of premium that can be charged, but obviously, uh, with uh, individual underwriting, uh, depending on whether or how good a farmer you are, uh, insurers will look at your loss rate, which, are, which is the, the amount, amount of losses divided by total sum insured going back maybe five years and uh, then a load for uh, you know, reserve, reserves and uh, administration expenses to come up with a, a, a tailor-made premium rate for uh, the level of, of uh, you know, husbandry or the the loss rate on, on, on your farm, uh, which can be lower than these standards. So you need to bear in mind that whilst these guides are there, the performance of your farm can be the basis of, uh, you know, computing a loss rate that will be specific to your operations. The same applies to livestock where we are covering normally death as a result of a variety of risks, which can be accidents or diseases. But I think uh, we will not go much on, uh, on these examples. I think we know fire, lightning, storm, cyclone, and all these others that we have mentioned. Uh, calving losses, uh, death due to surgical operations are covered with the fund by a qualified vet. Uh, that is very important. Um, and also emergency, emergency slaughter or destruction of an animal uh, for all your main considerations. Suppose uh, maybe it has broken uh, a leg and uh, there is no, uh, no means of, uh, of, of uh, uh, mending that, then uh, the veterinarian can just recommend that that animal is slaughtered. Diseases like anthrax are covered, uh, botulism, uh, lumpy skin, you know, rabies, uh, foot and mouth. These uh, uh, you know, cause a lot of uh, you know, uh, deaths of, uh, of our livestock, right? Uh, pulpy, kidney, and goats. Um, but for insurance, we normally say there should be a waiting period, which can be 14 to 21 days uh, if your animals are local. But when you have imported the animals uh, from uh, another country, the waiting period is normally 90 days 
uh, before your policy kicks in, just to make sure that you know uh, your, 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 your animals are not already infected by a disease. Right, as farmers, we need to be proactive and guard against uh, some of these diseases by vaccinating against the diseases. Here, I've just put in, uh, you know, examples of some of the of the of the drugs or chemicals that we need to always have uh, on the farm, uh, so that uh, we, you know, we we prevent uh, some of these diseases and prevent those losses. Because whilst insurance can come in, but you will never get hundred percent indemnity. There will be some other, you know, deductions that will happen like the excess and uh, so you, you, you are better off you know making sure that you have uh, a, a, a minimum of losses yeah you know, like your produce star you know which uh, will guard uh, you know your, your animals against uh, any uh, clostridium infections uh, which can uh, lead to tetanus and even anthrax they are called this star and that is the cost uh, your lumpy vax against lumpy, uh, lumpy skin disease, uh, contratic, system X against your flukes um, and roundworms, and then your tick grease against your ticks, the same as to contratic. Then high tech, you need also to have these antibiotics because whilst you may be dipping your animals, you can still have uh, you know, a, 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 an infection setting in because maybe just one tick that was infected bit your animal and then it, it transmitted the disease. So high tech and teramycin should always be uh, there on your farm and they, they have a very long shelf life. Uh, you, know, you don't need to worry about uh, you know, expiry, but uh, you will definitely need these uh, drugs at some point. Uh, then your penicillins, uh, intermectin again, against your external parasites as well as your internal parasites. Then exit. Uh, that, that to treat any injuries that may happen. So in your cabinet, you always need to have this. And the total cost of what I have uh, just uh, outlined here for a hundred cattle head amounts to around six hundred and sixty-nine dollars. Right? And this is uh, protecting you for almost a year. So you cannot afford to do that. This is maybe just the cost of maybe one beast. Uh, you know. And uh, where you don't, uh, you know, implement any of the of the measures that we are talking about, you can end up with uh, losing even uh, ten beasts. We know what have, what has happened in many parts of the country where entire heads have been wiped out by uh, your peniosis or general disease. So for livestock, this again is is, uh, is just a guide, but I did explain that you know it, it, management varies. Uh, from farmer to farmer in terms of preventing disease and treating disease, early diagnosis and treatment of disease. So where the loss rate is very low, you can have uh, premium rates a less, of less than 1%. Right? So don't uh, be afraid of uh, you know, uh, insurance because you think it may be expensive and you need to consult with your broker or your insurer and uh, they will advise you. Uh, if you know your, your loss rate on the farm is low, you will pay very, very competitive you know, premium rate. So what happens when you're applying for insurance? You need to, uh, uh, of course, apply before the cutoff date. If you are going to apply for maize, uh, you know, maize insurance, uh, you multiple insurance, you cannot do that maybe in January because the planting period for your maize maybe is uh, November. Uh, October, November. So it has to be before that, and there will be a cutoff date uh, where your proposal will not be accept, uh, accepted. Information that you need to have ready is maybe the crop that you are planting, where it's located, uh, your, your planting dates, your harvesting dates, your average yields for previous. Normally we say three seasons, right? But if you have records going back five seasons, it helps because, you know, uh, more data will mean your average is more, you know, more accurate. And then the way you have uh, had, uh, you know, good performance in the past, that is factored in, and then you enjoy lower, uh, you know, premium rates. The hectares that you have planted, what uh, your budget, your input cost budget, uh, which Rollins outlined, uh, will, will determine all that, or, you know, even your, your, your level of cap. And uh, the benefit of insurance is not just maybe the compensation that will happen, 
uh, in the event of uh, a loss. The insurance will also help with risk management where the insurer or your broker helps you to identify any exposures for that particular enterprise as well as other enterprises that uh, may, may affect, uh, you know, that may be on your farm uh, to, to identify the exposures that can affect those enterprises and uh, analyze the exposures, examine what uh, management techniques uh, can, uh, can, can, can be implemented to, to mitigate against those uh, exposures and so on. So it helps to have insurance because uh, the insurer is interested to make sure that the farmer is as profitable as possible, right? So that you remain, you know, viable and you continue to, to, to take uh, insurance. So they will help you not just on the crop that is uh, the subject of insurance, but even on the other enterprises. And, and uh, it, 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 because they, they deal with a lot of farmers, uh, they, they, it's, they will have some maybe knowledge from uh, other farms which they can then share uh, with you uh, if uh, you have maybe a, a problem that they have, um, they have come across in, uh, on a previous farm or in, in, on a different farm. I think that uh, brings me to the end of, uh, of my presentation. I'll, I'll take any questions. Great, John, and uh, thank you very, very much. Our time has just gone 11 to all our farmers and uh, facilitators. Uh, thank you again uh, for sharing all you have in terms of the possible risks that can affect the farming operation. So at this point, what I'd like to do uh, is perhaps go back to Rawlings and suggest uh, uh, that uh, I don't know how much time we have. Can Are we able to uh, accommodate uh, questions? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Patrick. I think maybe we take just a few uh, because we've received a lot of um, uh, questions and, uh, and comments. Terrific. Yeah, well, we thank you all our farmers for your participation. This is this platform is for you. It is the objective of the Insurance Council of Zimbabwe to always give you updated information so that you can make the very best decisions at any one point. Uh, and from what, uh, if you remember what Rawlings was saying, one of the most challenging things for our farmers is to make decisions. And the only way you can do that is by making sure you always have the best information to do that. So yes, Rawlings, please go ahead if we have any uh, questions and we can uh, start yeah, on sure. that. Sure, the first one is from um, Tino Tenda. Tino Tenda says, when are you sending the budget? Okay, thanks Tino. Uh, we'll share this, this uh, the budget uh, very soon in the Agribusiness Magazine and that's uh, our April issue coming out in the next few days. But what we've done is we've captured all the email addresses that we have uh, shared. Uh, then the next one is from Panache. Panache says, uh, thanks for the webinar. I didn't, I didn't have insurance and drought hit me this past season. Okay, thanks uh, Panache, uh, sorry for that loss, but thanks for, for the comment. The third one uh, that we uh, are taking is from Moriminomo. Moriminomo says, I think it's for, uh, it's for John, says, do you provide cover for uh, farmers without irrigation? Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, uh, most definitely there is cover. I think we mentioned at the beginning that the bulk of our farmers are, uh, don't have irrigation uh, and maybe they are small scale. And uh, we, we, we do provide doubt, drought cover, uh, which is not available uh, on farms that have irrigation because obviously you may not be affected by the drought. So all these farmers that uh, grow drying crops uh, can take uh, you know, the, dry, uh, the drought cover for crops like your maize, your soya bean, uh, paprika, and so on. There is not being grown under, under irrigation. All right, uh, thanks John for taking that one. Then another one for you here is from Mr. Muyengwa. He says, I'm planning to grow peas for export uh, this winter. Do you cover this as well? Yes, we do cover peas, uh, which falls under horticulture. Uh, and the premium rate uh, can be between 2% to 3% uh, and it will cover for frost uh, because you know it's a, it's a winter crop, it's grown under irrigation, it isn't a drought challenge. I think farmers are planting peas now and the major peril 
is frost the, that can happen. But uh, yeah, there is insurance for that. So you don't need to worry, you just need to approach your broker and uh, they will advise you on the insurer to, to work with. All right, uh, thanks uh, again, John. Uh, and whilst you are still there, another one is uh, from uh, Dube. Uh, they say, what is the minimum you cover for maize and also sugar bean? Uh, I think in terms of acreage. Well, uh, in, in terms of hectare, I think uh, five would uh, make sense. If you have five hectares and above, I think it would make sense uh, to, to have insurance. Uh, you know, a lower hit rate means that maybe the, the premium that uh, you, you is going to be charged may be uh, very low and, uh, you know, so administration of policies come with a cost which we mentioned. So the, the insurer may feel that uh, your premium is too low to, for the visits that may be required to the farm and so on. But if you are growing anything above five hectares, uh, it's, it's what will be worthwhile to insure. All right, uh, thanks uh, again, John. Then uh, I see a lot of questions and, and comments coming in, but because of our time, let me just take this last one is from Ronald. Ronald says, are we going to be given a handout of this uh, presentation? Sure, Ronald, what we have done is we have recorded the webinar and we will upload uh, it on uh, YouTube and share a link with you. Uh, so if you are subscribed to our mailing list, uh, you will receive the uh, recording. Uh, if not, please just share your email address so that we can add you to our mailing uh, list. Uh, I think because of our time, uh, these are the only questions and comments that we could take. Uh, over to you, Patrick. Okay, well, thank you, Rawlings, and thank you to all our farmers once again. Uh, we are delighted. Um, I'm not sure how many we have at this point that have attended today. But uh, we are going to urge you to stay in touch uh, and stay connected to ourselves so that you know when the next edition is. And you never know that uh, that bit of information you hear can help you to change course just in time. Keeping in mind, you don't have to be, um, you don't have to be a big business in order to manage well. Uh, but you have to manage well in order to grow big. So it doesn't matter how big you are. But uh, it's to start wherever you are and start the process of improvement and change so that you can optimize your operations and become the very best you can be. And what we promise you on this particular platform is that we will be bringing you the very best ideas available at any one time. So allow me once again uh, to thank our facilitators at Rawlings Coffee and also John Chirindo uh, for their contributions this morning. And to you all our farmers, uh, thank you for choosing us and we look forward to uh, coming together with you before too long. Thank you again to everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Insurance is there to protect you against the threat of financial loss caused by everyday events. It removes uncertainty by transferring the unknown consequences of losses from theft, fire, floods or accidents to an insurance company. The protection gained from paying an insurance company a regular sum of money is called a premium. By collecting premiums from many people, the insurer accumulates a pool from which losses can be paid for. We represent short-term insurance companies in Zimbabwe and are here to help you understand how they can help you with everyday insurance because you never know. For more information, call us on 0242-708-031 up to 2 or visit our offices at number 4 Josiah Tongogara Avenue, Harare.